This 10th year of Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Thanks to every single one of you, including Vince Power, Rodrigo Smith Zapata, and John and Becky Johnston. Coming up on DTNS, an AI that can understand a whole novel in 22 seconds and why you should care, a Google open source tool to play games with just your face, and who is this new Twitter CEO anyway? Who, who the heck? It's our story. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, May the 12th, 2023 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Chris Ashley coming from your local barbecue. And I'm the show's producer, Roger J. All right, folks, we've got a packed show. So let's start right in with the quick hits. Now, you know, China wants to develop domestic companies that can make chips so that they can get around those restrictions from the U.S. You know that because you listen to Daily Tech News Show. You're a smart person. Well, two stories right now indicate some setbacks for China in that effort. Pay attention to these. China's top smartphone maker, Oppo, always in the top five smartphone makers in the world, says it's shutting down Ziku, Z-E-K-U, its chip development division. Oppo attributed the shutdown to uncertainties in the global economy and smartphone industry, so no in-house designs for Oppo. And the second story, China's biggest domestic chip maker, SMIC, posted its first quarterly revenue decline in three years. U.S. sanctions prevent SMIC from getting chip-making tools to make the most advanced semiconductors now, and it's having an effect. SMIC is still seen as China's best chance of catching up with chip industry dominators like Samsung and, of course, the titan Taiwan's TSMC. Meta announced a new AI sandbox available to select advertisers. It provides three features. One lets advertisers generate variations of the same ad copy for different audiences. Mm. There's a background generator to create different media assets you know like images. Mm -hmm. And an image cropping feature to more easily post content across mediums and social chains. Meta plans to expand access to the AI sandbox in July. All right, so now we know what they're using their AI for. That's All right. why it's not in the search engine. <laughs> Got it. Surprise. <laughs> Wiz, spelled W-I-Z, has launched a new home monitoring feature that combines motion sensing from its light bulbs with an indoor security camera, new, a new camera from them, uh, to send you alerts if there's somebody moving around when there shouldn't be. The bulbs use a system that detects changes in Wi-Fi signal strength. We've talked about this on DTNS before, too. So it changes, it detects those changes in Wi-Fi signal strength, and then it knows if there's motion. The bulb will then tell if somebody's there and the new security camera will let you see what's going on. To take advantage of the new feature, Wiz is offering a home monitoring starter kit that puts three of these bulbs and the camera together for €159.99. That is available starting June 15th. No U.S. price yet for that bundle, but the camera is coming on its own. If you already have the bulbs, you can get the camera in the U.S. for $70 later this month. Well, if you drive a Toyota and you've been wondering why random people know how much miles and how much gas you're using, <laughs> Toyota disclosed that a database of vehicle data for 200, oh, sorry, 2.15 million users in Japan has been accessible without a password since November 2013. Wow. Ouch. <laughs> so if anybody tried to look, they could have seen it all. Data left public included vehicle locations and identification numbers. Now, Toyota made this data private in mid-April, thank goodness, and said there were no reports of it being misused. But really, who's going to say? <laughs> they left the door unlocked. They have no evidence. There's no right. footprints on the inside of the database. You right. Know? But by the way, Tom, nobody told Toyota that they actually took the data. <laughs> Nobody left a note. Nobody left a note. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's possible that thing has just been unlocked for 10 years and they just noticed and no, nobody else noticed. Right. It's also quite possible that's not true either. So, yeah. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, this one is uh, for the adults in the room. Adult communities uh, often want to allow legal. Let me emphasize these. We're talking about legal stuff here, but adult images on Reddit. Uh, things not safe for work. In the past, those might be hosted on Imager, but of course, as we've talked about, Imager is tightening its restrictions against adult content. So Reddit is stepping into the gap itself. If your community is set as 18 plus and Reddit has a system for that, it can now allow NSFW images to be uploaded directly to Reddit from the desktop. Uh, this feature was already available on mobile, but they have now expanded it to the desktop. 
All right, <clears throat> let's talk chatbots. Do you, you do you use Bard or ChatGPT or any of those things, Chris? Nah, I just having fun watching all the other people use it and all the crazy stuff that people are doing with it. But it's not my. I don't have a, a use case today where I'm just gonna go play around with it. Gotcha, gotcha. If if you were you, you might run into a couple problems. Uh, Perhaps, I'm just speaking theoretically here, you tried to put in uh, your whole novel and ask the chat GPT to proofread it. And it said your novel was too long and you tried not to take that personally. Uh, or perhaps you've been chatting, and this happens a lot, uh, the bot sort of forgets things you said earlier in the conversation. You chat long enough that it's like, it's not referring back too far. That's because both of those things are because of something called a context window. Uh, remember that, these work by breaking words up into tokens and then figuring out sequences. They're, they're just making predictions. Right. And how many tokens of information the model can process at once is, is called the context window. All right. Chat GPT can handle 4,096 tokens. That's about 3,000 words. So if you're like, oh, okay, yeah, that, that's why it started forgetting things. OpenAI's GPT-4 API is a lot better. Uh, so if you're using the API, you can handle up to 32,000 tokens at a time. Well, Anthropic announced that its Claude API for its business partners can now process up to 100,000 tokens. Mm. That's roughly 75,000 words. Your whole novel. That's more words than my whole novel. <laughs> exactly. I'm very excited. Uh, Anthropic demo demoed this capability by processing the entire novel, The Great Gatsby, uh, and to look for a single edited sentence. They, they said, find the sentence. Took it 22 seconds to process all of Gatsby and find the sentence. That larger context window also means it can carry on longer conversations. So apparently this thing can go for days and still remember context from a couple of days before. That's crazy. Um, yeah, so this is uh, really interesting. Uh, one of the things, I remember back when uh, Apple first announced, or even, uh, I think it was Bing actually, that uh, when they were talking about their um, Cortana and how it could be more conversational with you. And then, you know, Siri caught up and was able to be a bit more conversational with you. And I imagine that the problem was the same, which was remembering the context of the conversation. Yeah. So so this is the natural tra trajectory I would expect um, for to seeing this. But I could see things like for me personally, like if I'm uh, I'm trying to get better about planning some of like my um, projects. So currently I'm building a uh, a table. And uh, a, a console table from for to go onto my TV, and if I could just have like a conversational planning session with the with the Chat GPT, and I'm like, okay, th this is the dimensions that I want to use, and um, you know, here's the what the tabletop is going to be, and here's the overhang that I want to have on the top, and the you know the space inside. Okay, what type of wood? You know, what are my what is my cut plan? needs to be and then i can you know spit it out and then say okay well based on that you know i don't like the way it sits so can i you know what i mean so being able to yeah. work through a solution um you know or a project because you know the, the apps that, are, that exist out there to do that it, they're not ter you know crazy hard to use but i just not interested in learning how to use them um for a cut list. Hmm. So being able to have a conversation around that and then having it spit back to me, it's like, here's your cut list. Go buy a you know, four by eight piece of plywood, you know, make these cuts right here. I can spit out the, the difference and, you know, and being able to adjust those plans on the fly. That's uh, something I could, I could get behind and see some uh, really cool. Uh, Cause you could go back to it over days. And, exactly. And, yeah. And it exactly. remembers your project and all that. Yeah. Yeah. Cause not to often, mention you could actually upload whole manuals for right, the tools you're using, and right. give Why it not? a sense of what you're using. Yeah, right, and help me put it together. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So, and I, you know, oftentimes I'll, you'll find when you're in the middle of a project like that, and you know, something you had an idea of how it should work, but when the practical of cutting it or making it, you know, putting it together, not not so much. You know, the idea was great in your head, but not so great <laughs> in in you know in when you're actually building. Yeah, it. yeah. Well, Anthropic, uh, because this is in their enterprise uh, a API, this is probably not too surprising, but they imagine this being useful for businesses. Uh, sure. So large troves of documents, uh, you would be able to just say, can you find me all the instances of whatever? 
Uh, and Anthropic says this should outperform the existing vector-based search the companies use now. So, well, imagine when you're in the middle of, uh, I, you know, either a lawsuit, and then you know, as a law firm, you'll you, you know, give me all of these emails. You have to feed those emails into something, and then be able to search the context of the emails to find whatever it is you're looking for. So yeah. I could definitely see it from that professional aspect. Um, maybe, uh, and, and honestly, you know, when you have a lot of these European countries that are super stringent on you customer user data you know uh -huh. you could use something like this to say hey you know go find all the instances of this customer data so we can make sure we properly delete it so those you oh, know from a business yeah. standpoint uh -huh. i could see those things as well that's interesting like where is it hidden like what right. what other documents was it copied over to what other databases is it exactly. started what databases are left with a password unlocked <laughs> perhaps you could find that for me too. find all open passwords <laughs> yeah um <laughs> Yeah, I, this new uh, context window is available right now. If you're a user of the Claude API, uh, that's restricted by a wait list. So there's not a ton of those out there uh, right now. But but yeah, it's, I, I think Anthropic is making a play this week. We had them talk about their constitutions earlier this week. Now they're talking about how they, they've expanded this token space, this context window uh, right. in a huge way. Uh, these are both, let me, let me, hurry to say these are both real advancements they are real projects and and they're they're worth talking about uh but it is clear that anthropic wants to steal a little of that limelight from open api well, or, the, and from google because google's you know touting all their ai stuff this week too right well the interesting thing that always i think a lot of people miss when new software comes out is it's it's always exciting to see the new software and what it can do. But I actually kind of take a step back and kind of look to see what are the APIs that are available and what are people doing to you know, mm -hmm. take advantage of those APIs. You know what I mean? Because that's when the real fun and the real you know awesomeness starts to come in when you have people that you know really grasp what you're trying to do and then figure out ways to make it do more. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, we've got some other Google news out of Google I/O this week that isn't exactly. Well, it is AI, but it's not a chatbot. It's not chatbot related. Uh, the Verge's Wes Davis wrote an article called Google's Open Source AI Tool Let Me Play My Favorite Dreamcast Game With My Face. Uh, Google calls it Project Game Face. Uh, it replaces head tracking mouse gear, which usually costs in the hundreds of dollars. So it's, it's not super expensive, but it's not cheap with software that just uses your webcam. So you can program up to six facial gestures to act as your mouse or keyboard actions and then adjust typical mouse settings. So jitter, speed, all of that stuff. Uh, the algorithm is able to use what it sees from your webcam and translate that to head tracking so that you can do tilts, open mouth, that kind of stuff to control. Uh, this was developed in in conjunction with a gamer named Lance Carr after a fire destroyed his head tracking mouse, uh, and they were able to make this work for him. It's a GitHub project right now, uh, so not everybody's going to be comfortable navigating GitHub, but if you are, you can go try it right now, and it's available for free under an Apache 2.0 license. Yeah, this is really, really cool. Uh, first off, I love seeing like accessibility stuff that uh people are doing for gaming and uh even though you know because a lot of times stuff will start out in gaming but quickly it becomes available in other aspects of life but you know the older i get and i'm playing these games and and i'm just realizing like man i i don't have a lot of time left to be playing this competitive stuff <laughs> <laughs> the old fingers just can't keep yeah. up but you know if i could add in a head nod while i'm using my controller huh. you know oh, yeah. <laughs> why not yeah there's you know a combo I mean? there yeah that's interesting yeah, so it's just like, okay, you know, make, make, let's even the playing field for the old fella. <laughs> you know what I mean? But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I love the idea that uh, how they allow you to move and, you know, just the Ted tell. Yeah, of course, you know, the one downside is that you don't have a lot of inputs, right? There's only yeah, so much you can now. do with your head. So, you know, you'd hate to be somebody looking in the window and you're flicking your tongue <laughs> trying to <laughs> do some type of battle. And somebody's like, oh, this guy's got problems. You know, no, no, yeah. no, 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 no. I'm just playing what? the game. I want to know why they're looking in your window. I think yeah, they're well, the problem. Yeah. In that, in that's a, um, <laughs> Which came first, the tongue yeah. flick or the looking in the window? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, they, but but all kidding aside, they, they do yeah. definitely need to have more than six, and they 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 plan to expand on that uh, to to have a a wider range. But the fact that it just replaces the head tracking stuff altogether is 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 pretty cool. really really awesome. Yeah, uh, Wes Davis from The Verge tried it with Res from the Dreamcast. Um, 
that that's one where you you fire your weapon uh you move your cursor uh and you trigger uh the shoot everything so it's it's not a car you know it's not like a strategy game it's it's right. a move around and shoot game but it's but it's a fairly simple one uh and he said like it, it took him a little time to dial in the right settings but sure. but once he got it going it was totally playable and he said the the lag and latency wasn't bad maybe not competitive but it wasn't bad yeah yeah and that's definitely what it what it boils down to is uh just the proper use case and the type the proper type of game for it because i imagine that if you go from a gamer and then all of a sudden you know some tragedy hits and you can't game anymore but you can do something something mm-hmm. is better than nothing even with my brother um after he had a, a stroke and he lost a lot of the dexterity in his hands but the doctor said you know what if you can give him a controller and let him mess around and stuff mm-hmm. let him do it because it's familiar to him you know and it'll mm-hmm. help the brain rewire and you know it's good for him so um yeah so anything that i see that can help you know folks that have you know, had some type of accident or just you know haven't had the ability but now they have the ability man i'm all for it I, I, this looks like it's a very promising yeah and and this is called project game face it's obviously it's use cases gaming but uh this could be used for any mouse interaction yeah why not for, for any reason so uh it's useful in that way as well all right, folks, uh, we have a series on our YouTube channel called Top 5. Uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, we got a bunch of episodes over there. The latest one relives the decade of gas lines and disco, the 1970s. Uh, get your big collars and your bell bottoms and uh, watch Tom's Top 5 as we break down the most memorable pieces of consumer technology from the 70s, including top-loading VCRs. Uh, I'm just going to give that one away. But what else is in there? Is there computer stuff? Yes, there is. You can catch it. YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. That's YouTube.com slash Daily Tech News Show. Get the top five right now. All right. I'm really looking forward to talking about this one. Oh, let's go. <laughs> Isn't everyone? Uh, <laughs> Thursday during DTNS, the news broke that Elon Musk said he had chosen a CEO and she would start in about six weeks. That wasn't entirely true. Uh, 24 hours later, we know that, in fact, he did choose NBC Universal's head of advertising, Linda Yaccarino. And it looks like she might be starting now, not in six weeks. Uh, All right. You want to hear some interesting notes about how the announcement went down, Chris? I'm sure you follow. I got to. I got to hear this. Uh, Yaccarino was scheduled to present NBC's pitch to advertisers at its upfront on Monday. So when this came down yesterday, I'm like, well, she's obviously not going to start. They're not going to make this announcement for real till after she does the upfronts. And in fact, yesterday when NBC was asked for comment, NBC said, no, she's in back-to-back rehearsals for the upfront. (laughs) (laughs) Then Friday morning, NBC said, oh, about that, her rehearsals are done. They didn't say that part, but they did say she has resigned effective immediately. Right. Uh, And then Musk announced that indeed Linda Yaccarino will take over as CEO of Twitter. Now, he didn't actually say when, but it kind of implied that, well, she resigned. I guess the time is now, right? We, right. And uh, so we'll have some fun with this uh, right off the bat, because, you know, a common tactic uh, I've seen uh, at companies is when you announce that you're leaving, they're like, oh, you can just go right now. You know what I mean? So I'm wondering, is that what happened here? It's like, well, you know, I did plan. I was going to put my notice in. No, no, you can go right now. You know, what I mean? it's like we don't need you. <laughs> so I, did they get I, hurt? I think this is most interesting because. uh it is the first example, and maybe Elon Musk does this sort of thing on purpose, of like, get used to it. This is how I work, right? It sounds like Yaccarino had given six weeks notice, was going to do the upfronts, then make her announcement and dignified leave NBC sure. to join Twitter. And that when Elon Musk spilled the beans yesterday, that caused an uproar. And NBC's like, well, you can't do the upfronts now. There's too much of an uproar around you. Right. Um, so did she start sweating? Because the other day when he said, uh, I've already found my new uh, <laughs> my new CEO, did she start sweating? And I was like, please don't ruin this for me. Please don't ruin this for me. <laughs> I, I can't tell. Either, it has to be one of the two, right? Either it was like, oh man, what are you doing? Like we had a plan or it's it was them saying, well, he can say he's found someone and no one will know. And then the Wall Street Journal went and figured out who it was. So, sure. yeah, maybe they just didn't plan well. Oh, yeah, um, that is a viable option. Like, hey, do you want to, we believe this person's coming on. Can you comment? It's fine like, to drop a hint, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. I mean, 
a normal disciplined business wouldn't even do that at all. So there's there's that. Uh, let's talk about Linda Yaccarino, though. Uh, she has been with NBC since November 2011. Uh, she has been in her current position as head of global advertising and marketing for NBC since 2020. Before NBC, she was a Turner, and those are the only two jobs listed on her LinkedIn. Uh, so it, as far as we know, she's always worked in advertising and marketing right. uh, her entire career. Uh, do you know her nickname? I did not pick up her nickname, no. Wall Street Journal says they call her the Velvet Hammer. Right. Because she's got great relationships with everybody, but she's got hard-nosed negotiating tactics. I, I don't know who gave her that nickname, but they need help in making nicknames. I don't like Velvet <laughs> You don't Hammer. like that one? No. I, I, I it's very descriptive. Velvet, because she's got good relationships. Sure. Hammer, because she you know, hammers home the negotiation. You don't like I, that one? It's, too, it's just too much. It's, I don't know. I, I'm good not wrestling a fan of that one. But yes. The Velvet <laughs> Hammer. <laughs> off the top rope. <laughs> now... Uh, you, when you and I were talking about this earlier today, you yeah. pointed out that everybody's making a big deal about the fact that she seems amenable to Musk's free speech stuff. Yeah. Uh, so this is what I found weird in yeah. this announcement because, and you know, a lot of times when a, something big happens, I'd like to see all the different people reporting on it and see what's the common thread. Cause you know, I'm starting to you know, figure out that a lot of these times, here's what you're going to say. And then everybody repeats what, what they're told to say. And uh, the common thread that I was finding was that she had done an interview with uh, Mr. Musk and uh, yeah, she, she hosted the interview. She, yeah, she was right, interviewing she him. Yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. And then she pointed out, she's like, um, yeah, uh, we believe in the, uh, in, in, in the first amendment. I agree with you in the first in in his take on the First Amendment, and I was like, "That's kind of." But everybody was reporting it. Let's let's give it the exact quote here. Oh, right. If if freedom of speech, as he says, referring to Elon, is if freedom yeah. of speech, as he says, is the bedrock of this country, I'm not sure there's anyone in this room who would disagree with that. And then elsewhere in the conversation, she said, "Remember, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach," which is parroting a thing that Musk says a lot. So when I saw that. I was like, okay, we got to break this piece down. I don't know why it struck me, but the the problem is, I think most people that looked at what Elon Musk was saying about freedom of speech was like, come on, dude, that's nonsense, right? It you you're not the government, so you have nothing to do with freedom of speech. So when um when she when they pointed this out, it's like, did she tell him that? And then because she was marketing to Elon Musk for a job. Um, and selling herself as far as like, yeah, it was I can, only a month ago. So, yeah, <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Because it's like that, that, that freedom of speech. Yeah, you know, it's, it's there's nothing there. But then I was like, I started looking at her credentials. I was like, oh, she's got game. Like she's done some very successful marketing campaigns. Um, I, uh, she did one with the Pope and that was uh, very successful. And, and it was just like, okay, she's got a lot of game. So I, I don't yeah. know if you picked up on the uh, on the whole overemphasis I, I felt like on that this was, agreement. Journalists were trying to both sides this and show I, like she's friendly to Musk's freedom of speech, which I, I, I'm a little bit different than you. I think it's a, a worthwhile conversation to have like what speech should be allowed on the platform. I know what you're saying. It's not about the First Amendment. Right. Right. But but I, I think freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of reach is an interesting uh, thing. I, I don't think it's as crazy as it sounds. I think a lot of people were trying to take this as a, like, she's in his pocket. Uh, I think more telling and interesting mm -hmm. is the fact that she served on President Trump's Council on Sports and Nutrition, which right. a lot of people would not serve on on that Any administration's councils, yeah. uh, councils at all, but she was willing to serve. You know, Tim Cook uh, served on some some councils and stuff as well. But she was also chair of the Task Force on the Future of Work at the World Economic Forum, a decidedly not conservative uh, organization. Right. And she pushed for workplace diversity uh, at that. Which so I thought was interesting as well. She definitely is not on a particular easily pinned to a particular spectrum right and that's why i find this overall very and a very interesting move and something you know us who like to do uh, run a podcast and we talk about tech news that you know this will probably be something we'll be revisiting a lot throughout this year because to see the move she makes because the one thing that i've that i 
found was like, okay, she's definitely got game. She's definitely top notch in marketing, as far as I can tell, with all the reporting that's out there and the, the things that she's accomplished. So, how the the biggest problem with Twitter right now is the fact that Elon Musk ruined their marketing dollars, right, and almost cut it in half uh, with all the changes and all the things that he did. So you hire this expert in marketing to fix what you destroyed, but she's also then supposed to help move the company forward because clearly, you know, it's been reported that he wants to make Twitter like that center platform for everything. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, okay. and she's an expert at finding ways to monetize things. She's an expert. Well, expert. well said because uh, Musk says she's going to handle business operations while he focuses on product design and technology. So you're absolutely right. That's code for she's going to fix the revenue. She's going to repair the relationships with the advertisers. She's going to do better marketing. Uh, and he also wrote, looking forward to working with Linda to transform this platform into X, the everything app. He's still on that. So here's why I find this. Like, I, I think she has a lot of work uh, ahead of her. So as a lifelong uh, Commanders fan here in the area, in the D.C. area, we love our team, but we dislike our owner. So mm -hmm. no matter what general manager they brought in, they were always kneecapped by the owner. Mm -hmm. So having seen that and how that usually plays out in the end, are we going to see the same thing here where she has great ideas, great implementation, but the, the guy that has proven to make some knee jerk reactions that are detrimental to the company, will he kneecap her ideas constantly to the point where she's like, I can't do this. How long do you think she lasts? Well, so interesting question. I'm going to give her at least a year. Why? Because it from just looking at what she's accomplished and, uh, you know, how highly sought, off, sought after she probably is, she's probably like, I don't care what this dude do. She's going to have that energy in the beginning for a while. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Like, I'm going to write this ship because if she writes this ship, oh, man, she can do anything. You know, at that point, right? It's like yeah, I fixed yeah. Twitter. That you understand what that looks like on a resume? Here's a resume. I fixed Twitter. That's a wrap. Like, if okay, she can out if she can outlast him, right? I think that's the key, right? Back if up the can, Brinks truck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so. Real quickly before we get out of here, I want to get your reaction to this thing called Oak Scan. Okay, uh, it's from a cooperage. Cooperages make barrels for well they make barrels uh and this particular cooperage radeau uh makes them for wine they developed a near infrared spectrometry scanner that can instantly measure the properties of the wood they're going to make the barrels out of to save wineries and distilleries hundreds of hours of testing because different wood even from the same trees that are a few feet apart can release different polyphenols that affect the appearance, the taste, and the smell of whatever you store it in them, wine, whiskey, et cetera. So mm. Radu can not only tell you really quickly, like, oh, this barrel is going to have this flavor profile, but also replicate the profiles of woods that you want by being mm. able to say, oh, well, we'll make it out of this wood and it'll give you that flavor profile. First off, props to them for being able to amass a, the knowledge to determine what the effects of one versus the other is going to be on the outcome of the wine. I, 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 that blows my mind. Now, at the same time, I'm like, you're wasting your time with wine and bourbon. Come over here, scan this brisket, and let me know exactly when to take it off. <laughs> so it's going to be perfect. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to go for the wood chips. You went right for the brisket. Right that, yeah, brisket. no, I like it. Yeah. Scan this brisket. Let me know exactly 12 hours. Five minutes, 38 seconds. Perfect. <laughs> That's Boom, fantastic. we're good to go. <laughs> Give me that flavor profile. Uh, well, if you want to read more on this, there's a, there's a lot more about this and uh, and a bourbon company uh, that is using this technology that you can read in an Engadget article by Billy Steele. Go to Engadget.com or we'll have a link in the show notes as well. Uh, regarding the Pixel Fold, we got an email from Scott who wrote, while I agree that $1,800 is an eye-watering high amount to spend on a phone, it's worth taking a historical look here. Consider the first flip phone, the original Motorola StarTac, which came out in 1996 for $1,000, adjusted for inflation. That's $1,816 today. Mm. So 
pretty much the same price. No Over deal. time, that StarTac came down to the price point where even poor me had one, says Scott, <laughs> and they became extremely common and popular. Hey, listen, you can if you can find this is the key. If you can find a context to make you feel better about your expensive purchases, <laughs> you are living a good life because I have buyer's remorse for everything I buy that is expensive for a le- at least a month. The, the, lo- the more expensive it is, the longer <laughs> the buyer's remorse lasts. Yeah, so. I, it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, the comparison to the StarTech is great. Because I think we think of the StarTac as being cheap. I think what what this reminds me is like, oh right, the StarTac was once also very expensive right, right, when it right. first came out. Uh, well, before we let you go, Chris Ashley, uh, what you got going on to talk about to the folks? I know you just mentioned a brisket. I'm sure there's a good barbecue and tech cooking. Yeah, so we uh, just released our last episode of season four, uh, and we had another awesome pitmaster on there. Uh, Marcus McNack from Crimson Creek uh, Smokehouse, and uh, he has some great gems, so tips, and uh, you know he had a different upbringing when it comes to getting into barbecue, which I thought mm. was super interesting and then a great conversation. So yeah, folks that love barbecue tech or just love a great conversation in general, come check this one out for sure. Yeah. Good new episode fresh off the grill, folks. Go and get it, bbqntech.com. Also, thanks to our brand new bosses, Dennis and Thomas, who just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for for joining. Uh, folks, you can you can join our Patreon for free. This is a new thing we just started doing this week. Uh, if you don't have funds, but you want to get in, in case you know at some point you can get a little funds, uh, you can join for free at patreoncom DTNS. You won't get everything, but you'll get monthly updates. You'll get Roger's column, uh, and you'll get the Friday GDI where we play games. So just scroll on down past the paid options at patreoncom D T. N S. All right, Dennis, Thomas, and the rest of you patrons, stick around for the extended show Good Day Internet. It's Friday and we have games. I'm going to try to figure out Chris Ashley's personality type. Maybe I'll do Roger too. So uh, you, you, you might want to stick around. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back on Monday with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackermans. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scottis One, BioCow, Captain Kipper, Steve Guadalupe, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Contributors on this week's show included Justin Robert Young, Patrick Norton, Shannon Morse, Scott Johnson, and Chris Ashley. And thanks to all the patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>